Good evening. This is the Aliogana Festival of the Word, and tonight we are right about to start the Alfonso's Arrow Castle Memorial Lecture Series. Thank you so much for being here. I am Narissa Golden, the festival coordinator, and we've got an interesting evening, and it's an all-lady panel for you tonight, but it's going to be all good, and I hope you enjoy it. I uh, just want to do a bit of housekeeping as you join us um, to get started and uh, just to catch you up on what's happened so far and what's about to happen with the festival. We had a fabulous first day. If you missed any of the Meet the Author series, they're still live on the Aliogana Festival of the Word Facebook page. If you're on, watching us on Discover Montserrat, you also have the same videos there, as well as on the Discover Montserrat YouTube channel. But just because I know some people want an opportunity to enjoy all of it, we are going to do a marathon on Sunday, starting at about 10 a.m. You'll be able to just watch all of the videos one after the other, and you can interact in the comments with, um, with us at the festival and tell us um, how you're feeling about what you're hearing, what you're learning, and just the experience of, of getting to meet these new authors. We are so happy that they've taken the time to be with us, and that's going to be all day Sunday. Now, tomorrow is going to be a big day for us. It's the final day of the literary festival, but it's not over yet. Starting at 10 a.m., we have the book launch of Dr. Howard Fergus, Intrigue and Story. It's his new collection of poetry. Deanny Whiskey John, who you'll hear in a few minutes, she's going to be launching her book, Oomph writing stories using box paragraphing. And it's a, it's, she'll, you'll learn tonight about the creative way to improve uh, your writing. And Ian Gerald, he is going to be launching the Professionals Journal series. That's tomorrow, uh, starting at 10 a.m. at the Montserrat Cultural Center. Immediately following that is going to be the MVO uh, announcing the prize giving uh, for, their, for their short story writing competition. We also will announce the winners from the Department of Environment's uh, Pollution Poetry uh, Competition. So be there early so that you'll find out who, who are the winners. And then at 11, at 12 o'clock, we have another book party. This time we are launching new books by our visiting author, Corinne Anaya Clark from Trinidad. She'll be launching her Chronicles of Corinne series, and she'll also be um, be there on the panel with Royden Silcock, who's launching his Cassava Kids series. And many people know Royden as a event promoter, photographer, videographer, and now he has become a children's author. Uh, just to remember, if you have children and they've been participating in the book swap all week at the library, or even if they haven't, we want them to come tomorrow and find a book that they can take home and read. It'll be all theirs. Uh, we got books contributed from different people and also the best of books in Antigua. And we're so thankful for that, as well as those in the community who sponsored books as well. And then closing out the after the evening, actually, uh, it's our after lit fest line. We're going to be at the chit chat out back for play on words. This is going to be an open mic experience, poetry, rap, uh, steel pan music, you name. We, we're going to get to spend some time just enjoying the the evening breeze and getting some some good poetry and spoken word. So thank you definitely for what you've been doing so far with us, and we love the great feedback. Thank you. Uh, and we want you to, to continue to be a part of the process. So just rem a reminder that the Meet the Authors Marathon will happen this Sunday, November 20th at, from 10 a.m. Thank you so much for that. All right, so we are going to get started and I want to introduce you to our first um, presenter this evening. It's gonna be a workshop um, and I wanted you to have a chance to get a little bit more about Deanne. Deanne Whiskey John is the author of Oomph and the Caribbean Math Stories series, and she has a successful 34-year track record in education. 
Her book, Um, offers teachers a tried and tested strategy to teach creative writing using a box paragraphing strategy. She created the box paragraphing strategy in 2005 and has used it since to teach creative writing to primary and secondary students, respectively. She's certified to teach at the preschool, primary, and secondary levels. She possesses an executive MBA degree, a postgraduate diploma in education administration, a Bachelor of Science in business education with double majors in secondary school teacher prep and business as education, and a minor in mathematics, a diploma in education primary, a teacher's certificate in early childhood education, and a technician diploma in food and nutrition. She is currently uh, working with the Ministry of Education on Montserrat, and she has lots of experience working around the Caribbean in education, including the Turks and Caicos, Barbados, and Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, Diani. <laughs> Hi, Nersa. Good evening. How are you? Good Friday evening. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so happy that you're back with me. And I wanted people to have an opportunity to get to learn more about this. There has been quite a bit of interest wondering, how do we become better creative writers? And I'm going to let you do your presentation. And then I will come back at the end with some questions. Um, in the meantime, if you've got questions or comments, you can just share your comments wherever you're watching and we'll be able to include them in the stream if you if you wish so just go ahead and write your comments because we'll be able to see them here on the back end and we can always share them with the presenter so she'll get to know what you're talking about so over to you Diani. thank you uh, okay good evening everyone so today's workshop is entitled Becoming a Better Creative Writer. And I have three books, as Nerissa would have mentioned, Oomph, Mango Chow, and School Blues. And today I wanted to share a bit about Mango Chow. But before I do that, um, I would like to share with you what I call my Ikigai, a little bit about that. And Ikigai is your life purpose or your bliss. It's what brings you joy and inspires you to get out of bed every day. And at the beginning of my book, the intro, which is oomph, I start off by saying that every educator is a writing teacher. And usually teachers do not recognize the importance and complexity of teaching writing. So compared to all the other academic and communicative activities, writing and reading require more basic skills than speaking and listening. So regardless of the discipline, craft or profession one pursues, knowing how to write well will improve one's performance. All students need to develop their writing skills, which they can learn through concise teaching and consistent practice. And I've found over the years that many students think that they dislike writing and they seem to lack the confidence in writing, in their writing ability. So I would like you, first of all, you know, as we go through this presentation, to think about your ikigai. Um, and I'm asking you to do that because what we're talking about here is purpose versus passion. Now I write because it fills my purpose in life. I'm an educator and also an entrepreneur. And my writing was born out of my need to fulfill my purpose, which is to teach and lead. And I've also loved the entrepreneurial aspect of life, you know, whatever um business that is connected to education so i've had to develop my technological design skills publishing marketing all of those skills which really has very little to do with my teaching but because i needed to deliver a high quality service i had to develop those so i found persons to teach and support me where i lack the skills and that's the reason why I'm here today, because I was focused on my purpose. 
which was helping my students. And to do so, they had to learn to write. And coming out of that, helping my students learn how to express themselves using the written word, I ended up developing the strategy that you are going to experience tonight. So in real life, sometimes you have to operate outside of your comfort zone so that you can get the skills and assets you need in order to experience your true passion. My aim tonight is really to generate interest among the persons who are listening in using the um formula to strengthen the creative writing skills in emerging writers. And I hope at the end that I would have succeeded. So I'll give you an overview. So let's begin. Now, the narrative box paragraphing, there are four key strategies that are used in the book. The first is the box paragraphing that you hear about, and it's actually like tables. It's a detailed step-by-step -step approach that utilizes the actual boxes, and it helps the writer to deliberate in building his writing piece sentence by sentence. It's like a puzzle from the beginning to the end. And usually the writers stay in the box until we get to the end. To deliver this, I have developed some mini workshops and each mini workshop is like a coaching session, 15 to 20 minutes. It has four components. So there's a sensory, multi-sensory activity, something that would appeal to your participants, you know, something that's interactive and allows them to become engaged. There's the writing goal, there's a practice activity and a skill nugget. And the skill nugget is that essential skill that is required for the writer, the emerging writer to master in order to move to the next level. Each mini workshop begins with a reflective writing activity to structure the session. So at the very beginning, that is included as well. And then the third strategy that is used is journaling. It's, as I call it, taking your writing pulse. This allows you to monitor. It's like well, in the teaching world, we call it formative assessment, but to get an idea of whether your writers are thriving or whether they need further support. So it encourages writers to become accountable for their learning experiences. They're recording their experiences and they become conscious because usually when you write things down, you are more conscious of what you're learning and helps to improve their writing and their analytical skills. And the final strategy is one, you know, it's the mind setting talks. Now, when I wrote oomph, there's a first version of oomph. And when I wrote the first version, I gave persons one to three. And then I said to myself, I found some persons, they still weren't getting the result that I got. And I examined my strategy and I realized that I did this, which is appealing to the emotions and achieving what I call a shift in the way the student was thinking. So I've included as well some mind setting talks that I have used and I thought they would be very helpful for teachers and writing coaches to help the students to become better writers. And even for writers themselves, they would learn how to reflect on these talks and seek to develop the strengths that these talks would build in you. So they're power statements that will change the writer's attitudes towards writing. You can develop your own power statements. It would be things that would reinforce your passion for writing or reinforce the reason why you need to write because it will fulfill your purpose. And so these power statements are genuine and they reinforce your belief in your student's ability to write well if you're a teacher. And to me, they are probably the most important 
aspect of the delivery in the earlier stages. Now, these are 10 mindsets that I offer. And you'll notice that the first one says communicating. And you may not have seen that before because it's a word that I coined. Um, you are accustomed to communicating, but I have changed that to communicating. And I'll share in a bit what that means. But I have 10 mindsets that I suggest that writers should try to develop in order to be successful. Some writers, they do it naturally. And for budding writers, emerging writers, you may have to give them activities and talks and give them experiences that will help them to develop this kind of mindset, shifting them away from the traditional I cannot and to that new way of thinking that I can. So in the book, um, I have developed a framework, but if you are a writer at this time, you would have a framework. And if you want to be, if you're aspiring to be a writer, you need a winning framework. So teaching students to write effectively, we know it's the most important lifelong skill. You know, all our exams, everything is done through pen and paper. We have to write most of it. And even if you're not writing, you're typing, but you have to have the ability to express yourself. So writing coaches, when you are trying to develop this skill, you must plan. There is no getting around that. You need to select and use the best strategies and resources and support materials to create the appropriate writing environment. It is usually a very, I wouldn't say complex, but you have to take your time. It's like you're planning an event and you cannot do this in a sloppy manner. So you must plan, you must choose the best strategies. And, and for that reason, that's one of the reasons why I'm promoting oomph because I've taken the time to do so. Because if you're doing it on your own, there's some things that you need to consider. You need to focus on what is your writing goal. And if you are writing, and not teaching it, you'd have to determine, how am I gonna get my content? But if you're teaching, how will you deliver this content? And that is critical. Because most times uh, we take it for granted that you shouldn't be taught how to write, as in the mechanics of it. We just say, write. Then you also want to consider what kind of writers do you hope to create? What kind of mindset do you want your writers to have? Do you want them to persevere? Do you want them to continue writing after they have left you? For writers who are writing now, you know, you want to have the mindset that you'll be able to sustain your writing efforts. And then you also have to consider what reinforcing activities to students require to succeed. In other words, you know, what activities in the classroom, materials, um, the sessions, the lessons, what do you need to give to those students to close the gap so that they can write and get to the other side and begin imagining and unleashing their potential? And finally, what support systems do you need in order to support your writers? Now, as the title says, this requires that you, the coach, not just the students, you also need to have a strategic mindset. And most times we are not looking at the whole picture. You know, we begin, we teach one lesson, then we move on. But it has to be a strategic approach, a whole big picture approach, because you have to know where you want to take your writers. What is the end goal, both in the short term and in the long term, so that you can pace and ensure that all your activities are well planned to get your students there. So OMF offers a framework, and the framework has eight steps. Tonight, I'm only going to deal with one step. And the steps are connect, and that is the communicating that I spoke about, coaching, 
those are the mini workshops and i'll share one with you skill up which i call the practice writing so after you've done the workshop you have to write and four is inbox where we actually use the, the box paragraphing template five we provide feedback six we revise and edit and seven you're out of the box eight we reflect and we make our journal entries now this cycle repeats itself and usually you come out of the box at the very end you know but as you go along if you start with very weak writers what you'll find is that you may come out of the box if you're doing a story after you have taught them how to do a good beginning um you may then you know say okay we can publish good you know just beginnings or we may be doing beginnings and middle and so on so this is flexible but the framework itself is one that you can adjust but basically you would need all of it in order to be successful and it is tried and tested. So I'm going to deal with step one, connect, communicating. And this is a term that I coined because what it does is that it connects heart to mind. To develop strong writers, you need to inspire them. Horace Mann says, attempting to teach without inspiring the pupil with a desire to learn is hammering on cold iron. And the first, the very first step in writing is that you have to connect. You have to make that connection. Now, effective communicating shares information with all learners. It explains why they should develop their writing skills and connect the reasons to their needs and interests. And that is the hook in this connecting the reasons for writing to the students needs and interests that means that you need to know their needs you need to know their interests the communication will only be useful if the information that you're sharing with your students will contribute to their writing success so you know sometimes we just put marks five out of ten or a tick here that does not help it's not good feedback it doesn't tell the writer how to improve and how to get better it's also critical that you are empathetic and genuinely care show care you know by showing interest in the writer's journey you know asking them questions about their writing and and you know what inspires them you have to make the writing meaningful, connected to their lives, to their environment, community, to what's happening at present. So, you know, if you're choosing topics, choose things that are topical to them, that they can relate to, things that they're excited about, things that are happening around them, uh, rather than foreign ideas and things that are alien to them. And this is the crux of the communicating mindset building that heart to mind connection you need to not just develop it in yourself sorry within the student but also within yourself and you also help the writers to develop the skill as well now you share with the students why they should invest in their writing and this will motivate them to write and you can use a lot of external and internal factors because the challenge with writing is to keep students interested and committed. You know, you can get them to write for the assignment. As most students would ask, is this for marks? So they will write for marks, but they're not going to develop a love for it. And you want them to develop a love for it, to see that they can use it to express themselves, to see that they can use it to find their passion and to fulfill their purpose. So that is the challenge. And that is why communicating is so critical when you want to develop and become a better writer. You need to do this, most importantly. 
share the what. This informs them of the actions they need to take. And so when you're giving feedback, you know, share with them. I think you need to improve on this area or I think you need to do less of this. Can you share with me? And I'll give you some ideas of how we do this. Share the how. So if you say to me, I'm not doing it well, you should tell me how to do it differently. And then connect all three to their writing goals. The writers themselves should set goals for themselves. They know themselves better than you know them. And they can set achievable goals. And you will look at their goals and connect everything. And most importantly, encourage them to stretch themselves, challenge themselves. Because normally they would be safe. So communicating is critical, critical to people becoming better writers, okay? And this is the plot diagram that I normally would use. And I just shared with you because think about if you took one of those children's stories or movies or things that they love and you now demonstrated to them how what they love what they are interested in can be aligned to writing using the plot diagram you'll bring it to life for them and that is so important for them to connect to see that what their reality and your theory can twin and come together and they can become writers. They can actually do that because they may not have taken the time to break it apart, to analyze, to think, oh, that's the beginning, that's the end, that's the middle, that's a roadblock. But you can take what they love. You can take things that they're familiar with, stories that they, they know and bring it to life for them. When I spoke about the quality feedback, this is what I mean. I call it top, totally on point, and that is when they meet and exceed the success criteria, or tip, I'm giving you a tip, a suggestion to improve your performance. Look at the language. It's not just general, it's specific to the writing. You grabbed my attention with your introductory sentence. Your second roadblock was well-crafted and believable. Or you may be asking them to please explain this to me or asking a question. What writing strategy did you use? And you can develop your own rubric and your own idea of providing high-quality feedback connected to the writing so that you are actually giving them a roadmap you're telling them either you have met the criteria you're you have done it you have achieved it you're doing well or you need to do some more work to meet the criteria and so this is how you can improve everyone has experiences and sometimes i think we ignore their experiences and so this message is for those persons who want to write you have your experiences and usually we underestimate our experiences or we think that they're too simple no one will benefit from them but i say to you this evening you should harness your experiences because there is someone out there who can benefit and in the classroom teachers you will be more successful if you actually harness the experiences of your students use their stories in the delivery in the teaching of the how-to so let the students recount their favorite materials share what programs they love to watch what movies they like what videos they're interested in and then weave their interests and preferences into your activities. That is building that heart to mind connection. And eventually 
what they're going to figure out is I can do this. I can really write. So this is a sample of one of the mini workshops and you'll see the activity at the beginning. This would have been from the workshop from before where that intro activity reminds them of what they did in the last session. And then you have your workshop objectives. It's all laid out for you. So remember, I, I spoke to the framework. How will you deliver the content? And so the mini workshop is the how. How are you going to do this? In your coaching session, this is the mini workshop that is meant for the 15 to 20 minutes. And then at the end, there's an activity and the skill nugget. The skill nugget in this instance is a technique to help the student remember what you need them to, to recall in order to write. So if you're going to write beginnings, you need to understand or you need to remember, I should say, um, what are the different types of starters that they were taught. So if they develop a rhyme or a song, when they are ready to write, they will quickly think through that and say, okay, I can try a question or I can try a statement or I can start with a joke. They will realize I don't always have to start with once upon a time or those, you know, the, the, the traditional worn beginnings that you would see in all the stories. Um, they can be unique. They can use their imagination and they can develop a range of starters. But once they have done this, they would have mastered that and they would have their toolkit would be a bit stronger um, than when they started off. Because normally they would tend to copy what they see when they read. And we know that it's now that we're seeing a lot of Caribbean literature. But generally speaking, they would see their story started once upon a time. And so the children, they tend to have a very restricted um, vocabulary and limited expression when they are starting their stories. So this mini workshop is just about the introductory sentence. And remember I said the box paragraphing strategy is one where you would normally write line by line. This is just one line, the introductory sentence that we would practice. There are eight different ways that I suggest in the book, call it the big eight that you can start your stories. And of course, there may be more that you, the experts, the teachers can come up with. And even as a writer, if you're an experienced writer, you may have a range of other options that you would want to try. But I have a core big eight in the book that I offer that you can use to start your stories. And there are, I believe it's 10 workshops um, in the book. So every aspect of the, the story, the beginning, the middle, and the end, line by line, the workshops are created to guide the workshop, the writing coach, so that the writing coach can help the reader, the writer, sorry, to build the skill line by line. So you will see several of these in the book. And this is the big eight. And you'll see, I have suggested you can start with drama. And we should know a lot about drama in the Caribbean. We often, we enjoy drama, a challenge, a location, a visual image, and not a picture we're talking about, but using your literary devices to create a visual image, a question, a fact, a personal statement, a quote, and of course, you can add more to this. But in the book, you were you're given this graphic and you can add to it and the steps to take in order to build a skill. Now, I have come to the end. I've given you an overview and I don't want to spend all of the time just talking. Uh, you can purchase a copy of Oomph online or locally. Um, and so if you are interested in having a coaching session and you purchase to access the coaching session, you can purchase a copy of Oomph and contact me. You have my email address and this offer ends. I have extended it to December 
And once you purchase the cup, you can tap to me and I'll book a session, a coaching session for you for free. So this brings me to the end. And I hope that we have some questions. I would like to open up the session so that persons can interact if we have any questions at this time. I'm not hearing you. Thank you, Diani. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, my first question, as we wait for mm -hmm. other people, please go ahead and put your questions in the comments. Mm -hmm. Remember, there are no silly questions. We're, we're happy to answer them as it relates to creative writing. You spoke very specifically about a teacher working with a student. How could we adapt that if we are the, the writer that mm -hmm. wants to improve these? I noticed you had some very specific techniques in the beginning. Do you think those work for somebody trying to self-manage their own process? Yes. So if you're writing for yourself, your framework, you must have a framework and your framework will look differently in the sense that where I have, um, how will you deliver the content? You will be asking yourself, where am I going to get my content from? You know, you'll have to develop your research techniques to ensure that you gather your content. Because even if you're writing fiction, it requires that you do serious research um, to make the story believable. Uh, when we're teaching story writing, you know, in the middle there, you have the roadblocks. And those roadblocks, as I tell my students, they are failed attempts to solve the problem and they must be believable. But to do that, you have to do the research so that you can develop your storyline so that when people read it, even if it is fantasy, it's believable. You know, sometimes you would have gone to the movie and a movie is so far out that you say, no, nah, this is not true, this can't be true, and you don't believe it. Um, you need to capture persons imagination and to do that it has to be believable so the framework for you would be that you set your writing goal you research you develop your research skills conduct your research get, get your content and then you map out your strategy of course you have to put things in place like your timelines and things to motivate you and keep you on time and notice I started off by saying building skills. You have to build some skills if you don't have it already. Your technological skills, your marketing skills, your editing skills, or you get persons um, who can assist you to do that if you don't want it to be very costly and having to outsource everything. So you'll have to build some skills as well. And then once you've built those skills, you write your book because you have your content. You can use the technology. You do your draft. And then you look towards having persons like an editor or someone you, whom you think can give you good feedback. And that feedback is what you would now take, do your final draft, and then try to publish and bring to market. And usually you can put a timeline on yourself. It helps set a timeline for yourself that that's so true i remember when i started writing you know it's all about the mood oh i feel like writing today so i write yeah. <laughs> and then there are other days you don't feel like writing and then you yeah. don't have any product but there's actually a discipline to that i like that idea of creating a framework because then mm -hmm. actually that actually creates some intentionality about yes. wanting to do that and i think especially for um and caribbean people i'm sure a lot of people are but i know caribbean people because we do everything by the mood and how we feel yes. uh, being intentional setting clear goals and mapping out that structure is so important if you've got questions for diani go right ahead and put them in the comments we're happy to share them um diani now you spoke about um you only gave us a teaser of it yes um Tell us about, did you use that process when you were writing the other um, literary the books? books. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the books that I design, yes, because they start with a story and then I tease out the numeracy in them. So I built them the same way, having a beginning um, and essentially there's a problem 
in the beginning and then the the main character tries to solve the problem and as in any good story you know when we start at the very beginning i say to them okay start with at least two roadblocks eventually you you know you have two roadblocks and then you get to your um high point and and the two roadblocks has to be two attempts to solve the problem but you must fail um mm -hmm. in the book basically i i would have done a, a similar approach i didn't make it too lengthy because it's meant for little ones mm -hmm. and essentially i did use that i used it uh, but i also want to add something nurse you mentioned about the writing goal and you know there's something i'd like to say to persons when you write your goals they are so they become so tangible you know like you would write i want mm -hmm. to write a book and i probably want to sell 100 copies by 2023 Mm -hmm. um let's say march 2023 mm -hmm. and by writing it and reading it every day you know um it, it gives you a sense of urgency because you have True. kind of committed yourself to that and then share it with somebody else and that's the, that's the the power of the writing of the goal even in the classroom when the child writes the goal and shares it with the teacher or if the writer writes the goal and shares it with someone like you know who you know would spur you on because you need someone that you're connected to who will support you you know remember i spoke about what support system do you need um in order to become a good writer you must know yourself for some people they probably need um one good friend who knows about writing or someone who's their their cheerleader in the background who says you can do it you do that now i have a bit of both i have one who will push me and say i want that book by tomorrow <laughs> and then i have the cheerleader who will say you can do it you rock so <laughs> you need the support system that is that is so very true um supporting is really important and because writing is also a very lonely journey it um is. it's it in fact what's interesting for me is that the, uh, why i'm interested in your project a lot is because mm -hmm. i actually came across this formula because um, i i write about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and i think the last two books on entrepreneurship that i happened to put my hand on both mm -hmm. writers use creative writing formula to teach this business idea and i just thought yes. oh my god this is brilliant and so i tried it for the last book i wrote start grow thrive and it, yes. it was so easy to teach all of the principles that i wanted to with using this formula and yes. basically it's the same formula as if you were watching a movie like you just said yes. there has to be a problem you know what what's our hero's challenge yes. what are they the obstacles to them getting it resolved who is yeah. blocking them from getting it? Have they tried? Did it work? Can they try yeah. again? And yeah. that process. So that's actually quite fascinating that yeah. you've done that. Yeah. Uh, and Dia go ahead. Now, I was just going to tell you that um, leaders, some of the best leaders are excellent storytellers mm -hmm. because you have to be able to convince persons to walk and to join you, to follow to do what you would like them to do. You have to be able to craft your story. It has to be believable. It has to be authentic. It has to connect with everyone for persons to stay with you. You know, people say people don't leave jobs, they leave the leaders. Mm -hmm. So if you can't craft a good story as a leader, and that's why I started off saying my purpose was to teach and lead. But the first person you need to do is you need to lead is yourself. And that's why you need a framework because you have to work on yourself. If you're going to be a writer and, and espouse things or, you know, essentially you're working for yourself, you have to lead yourself. So you need the framework. You need the support systems. You need to know you. And then once you understand yourself and get in touch with your purpose, Whatever your purpose is, sometimes the writing is not what you're passionate about, but you need to write in order for it to fulfill your purpose. 
Well, I think one of the things that's very, that a lot of people don't think about, they might say, oh, I don't like writing. Yeah. But um, to be a good speaker, you need to write. Um, and whether it is that you're going for a job interview, yes. whether you've got to share, even in a job and you have to lobby your boss to get yes. more money for your department, you all write. of that, you have to write. You have yes. to tell a story. You have to be able to, to sell tell the boss on the idea of yes. this is why we need the money rather than give it to the other department. Correct. It's all storytelling and yes. um, it's not um, something that's outside of the capacity. And I think the system that you've created is quite simple. And I really love the, um, the clarity that it can bring having that structure. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me just check that. So post a suggestion that storytelling enhances teaching as well. Storytelling can work wonders in the classroom. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what uh, Diani is showing us is that she's used it for math. She is a, yeah. a, a numeracy, <laughs> a numeracy uh, consultant, yeah. and she is using storytelling to help um, children yeah. fall in love with mathematics. How do you actually do that though? We have a bit of time before the next panel. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you, how well, do you actually do that? How does it work? Let's say for somebody, cause you know, a lot of schools have the challenge where they pass kids over. So they yeah. get to maybe yeah. secondary school and they still have some basic multiplication issues. How do yeah. you actually help them get through that? Well, um, let me be clear. How do I how do I help them use the stories to teach the numeracy? Yeah. 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 Well, I demonstrated it. You know, we had numeracy week and literacy week. You see me changing the thing to numeracy week. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that might be another uh, week we, we need to add. Yes, we had literacy week, and I was dressed as Mango Queen because in the book Mango Chow, it's a story about um, the main character. They're walking home, and they pick some mangoes. Now they picked 10 mangoes and he remembered his, they were too green to eat. So when he got home, he said, he told his friends, you know, let's ask mom to show us how to make mango chow. Mom gives them a recipe for five mangoes and they had to adjust that recipe because they had 10 mangoes. And it was amazing to see because, you know, when I go back to school, I went back out today and the children say, Mango Queen, you know, we what, you remember the mangoes and so on. And I asked the children, can you change the recipe from the five mango recipe to the 10? And that meant that they had to double up, multiply everything by two. And they did that successfully. And so the book. That one is number sense. And so it helps the children to see that you count every day. In the story I talk about where the owner of, of the tree, Mr. Sam, he puts his mango together in heaps of fives and ten. And out of that, the teacher can have a discussion, you know. So if he puts out seven heaps of mangoes, how many heaps, how many mangoes would he have sold? There is so much um numeracy in our stories but we have never really extracted it because we have been focused on the literacy aspect only because numbers is life numeracy is life numeracy is at the heart of solving problems so we did that and at the end of the story we also did things like counting backwards out of 10 i you know adjusted the rhyme you know 10 green mangoes hanging from a tree if one green mango accidentally fell how many are you left with and so the children will be using something that is common to them. You know, some children said to me, you know, mango is the national fruit. I said, oh, I didn't know that. And they loved it. They lapped it up. And they, they didn't realize that they were really doing a little bit of math. We have been using stories to socialize children, pass on culture, all our cultural beliefs. You know, they know all about all the things like the soup we are, we saw that on the book parade and all those things. Why not use stories to pass on math? And so I've made a deliberate attempt this time around to when I write the stories to extract the numeracy from the story and build it. You can have one story and use that story almost for the entire term and build so many math concepts out of that one story. Yeah, so I... 
plan to work along with my teachers um just because they are brilliant people and they can craft their own stories they don't have to use my story now i do want them to purchase mango chow <laughs> but they can craft their own stories and just socialize the children you know build that familiarity with numbers oh i'm seeing some things i saw a storyteller <laughs> teaching fractions to toddlers with yes yeah so you see it is something that we can use but we have not been using it that way because you know um most times we are afraid of numbers even parents you know we don't want to do the wrong thing but i'm saying embrace it so now it gives them a structure it allows parents to have a structure where they can feel safe to introducing numbers from a very early time except for counting you know we'd have that many books are counting one to ten but beyond that you're not seeing anything out there doing that you know taking the numbers and i've done one on measurement as well that's wonderful thank you uh apologies to those of you who are on youtube who are sharing that you're not able to leave a comment if you inbox the literary festival's facebook page if you have a chance to um, i'd be happy to share your comments okay. with diani yes. and we can always come back to them later yes. um i am going to ask we, we have a bit of time before we're supposed to start the next panel there's some panelists who are not on yet okay. uh, but i see the host for the next panel on and i want her to jump in here because she is actually the founder of Montserrat uh, about of the Brain Pr Trust. Hi, Shirley. Hi, Larissa. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, How are you? Good evening. And I, yes, Good evening, and I yeah. know her, her new project that she, they've just released a book of, um, it's an alphabet book, mm -hmm. and it really uses all of the things that are common to Montserrat um, to, to go through the alphabet and things like that. Um, so Shirley, tell us about that book, why we got a bit of time before the uh -huh. other panelists show up. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the book came out of, at the Brain Trust, how we work is we do, we have children play. We do play to learn. Um, you might know, you might remember Marissa, my mom was a, was a teacher and I've seen her throughout my life use games and stories and things um, to, to help children learn. And so it's always been, been part of my life. And we were doing uh, an alphabet thing. Actually, I had the children reciting the alphabet backwards. And it was just so much fun. And in the process, we started looking for, I started asking them for monstration things that, you know, belong to whichever, whichever letters. And we made a game out of that. And it was so much fun because we used um, not just the, the objects the, or the fruits and so on. We actually use some of the language. So for example, in Montserrat, we don't say tamarind, we say tamun. So we actually okay. have tamun in the book rather than tamarind. Um, and we have, you know, standard for alphabet books is A is for apple. But we don't just have apple. We have custard apple, mommy apple, sugar apple. Oh. So it's things that, are, that the children are familiar with. And we had such fun with it. And then... Um, I don't know, I can't remember which child said it, but the, you know, teacher write this down, we must do this again, was, was kind of, was, were the words that, that, that they used, and um, we did that, and out of that grew the book. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's brilliant. I think a lot of what we are hearing so far tonight, and I know the next panel is going to just put some exclamation points on it, but it's really about valuing ourselves and what is unique to us. And, and changing the narrative so that we are the heroes in the story, as, as I think Diane would say. Uh, <laughs> we are the hero that has a problem, yes. and it's a problem that may be unique to Montserrat or another Caribbean island or wherever we are in the world, but we can come up with a unique solution for it and one yes. that amplifies who we are. So that's so good. Uh, Diane, tell, tell everyone again. I'm going to actually try to share it on the screen, let everybody mm -hmm. know how they can... Uh, get in touch with you. And All right. So, so if you would like to purchase the book, um, you can get it on Amazon as well. You can contact me at denki2 at gmail.com. Um, <clears throat> if you purchase the book, and I believe I gave you up until December 22nd, and, and that's a special day to me, um, you can benefit by having a free coaching session. So I will demonstrate how you can use oomph, um, whether you are going to teach or whether you want to 
you know, whether you're a teacher or whether you're a parent, I can demonstrate. And if you're a writer who needs help, I can also do that for you as well. So I would Wonderful. guarantee you one free session. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. I was going to ask you if, because I, I actually know a parent who wants yeah. some help with their child with, with creative yeah. writing. So it's good to know that also parents can use this to, yes, to, they to, can. to work with their children. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Diani, for that. We are going to get started in a few minutes, but I just want you to remember some of our upcoming events. Tomorrow morning, we have the book launch at 10 a.m. at the Montserrat Cultural Center. It will be Dr. Howard Fergus releasing his latest collection called Intriguing Story. He says it is his largest book um, book collection in a while. In fact, I think is his largest compilation. It's over a hundred poems. Um, Diani, who we just had the workshop with, um, she'll be releasing oomph writing stories using Vox paragraphing. And Ian Gerald, he is going to be launching his professional journals series, and that's at 10 a.m. And immediately following that, we have got the book party and fun day, and we will be launching the books um, from Corinne Anaya Clark, uh, Chronicles of Corinne, and also Royden Silka will be introducing his Cassava uh, Kids series. Those are the two children books happening um, starting at 12. There's also going to be the prize giving happening for the MVO and the Department of Environment Poetry Winners Competition. So please join us. We have got a ton of fun for the children. You are not going to believe how we are recreating and what we what they're doing um, with the Montserrat Cultural Center. So you have got to see it as long as you're on Montserrat. Don't just wait to see the pictures on Facebook. If you're on Montserrat, please come down to the Cultural Center from about 10 a.m. for the first book launch, or you can come for the, the second book launch at 12 and just hang out with us for the afternoon, bring the children. Uh, we've got cupcakes, we have got um, think popcorn for them. There's face painting, there's bouncy castle. Please come hang out with us. And then later in the day, after we've recovered from bouncing around, you can hang out with us at Chit Chat Outback. It's going to be our after lit fest line, and it's going to be a spoken word session, play on words, and it will benefit Meals on Wheels. So, be, so bring a generous donation as well. There's going to be steel pan performances, poets, rappers, you name it. Just come hang out with us. That's at eight o'clock tomorrow night at uh, Chit Chat Outback. And for those of you who were, haven't been able to take in any of the Meet the Author series, we are going to do a marathon on Sunday starting at 10 a.m. Uh, just pull up on whichever platform you want to, and you will be able to just enjoy all of the interviews that we did one after the other. So thank you so much for the support. We love in the feedback. If you missed last night's movie night, you missed you missed a really wonderful time. So don't make, so make sure that you are with us on Saturday. Thank you so much for that. Looking, really looking forward to being back with you tomorrow live. I want to just say that the, the, the Aliogana Festival of the Word is brought to you by the Munster Arts Council, my company, Golden Media. We're so honored that we were able to come back this year and, and do this. We also have the governor's office, Department of Environment, the Montserrat Public Library, Montserrat Volcano Observatory, and the Friends of Aliogana Festival of the Word, who just you know make magic happen, but don't want anyone to know that they do it. We're so thankful for them. Uh, are you ready to get started with the next panel? I see most of my panelists here, and we are just ready to jump right in. Now, this session is going to be moderated by Shirley Osborne, and I am going to leave her to do the magic. Thank you so much for being here. Don't go anywhere. Please keep putting your comments in, um, in and we're happy to share them as we go. Shirley, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Narissa. Thank you so, so much. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening to the public. Um, I'll be introducing the panelists in a little bit. 
Let me just say I am really, really honored to have been asked to moderate this particular panel um, in, at the, the 13th Alfonso's Arrow Castle Lecture Series in, as part of the 14th, 1-4, the 14th Aliogana Festival of the Word. 14 years is a good long number. And um, I, I'm sorry I had to miss movie night last night because I had a, a funeral, Nerissa, but um, I'll be catching up. So anyway, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Shirley Osborne, and this is the Alphonsus Arrow Castle Lecture Series 2022. The topic for tonight, the question that we are going to consider has to do with language, has to do with language. And I'm going to be talking to our panelists about various forms of language, and in particular tonight, dialect is coming up. The, the actual question is, language as protest. How does preserving our dialects serve as a tool for nation building? How does preserving our dialects serve as a tool for nation building? So we're actually going to be talking about language and talking also about, in Monsat's particular case, rebuilding, um, and just sort of moving forward as a people. I am really looking forward to this. Um, as we go along, please drop your questions, comments, suggestions in the box, and Nerissa will, will send them to me. If you have any, please ask questions. I have some, of course, and the panelists are going to tell you some things about themselves and the work that they do, which will generate some others, but it'd be really, really interesting and good to have your questions also. So, when you're ready, Nerissa. Okay. There we go. Good evening, ladies. Good evening to my panel. Good evening. It is wonderful to see you, and marie it's wonderful to meet you, Dr. Arendel. <laughs> so we're going to get started. Um, I have your bios, of course, but I would rather you tell us about yourself. Um, uh -huh. And Anne-Marie, um, <laughs> I remember you're from school. So <laughs> And so, um, but since we are both at home, we let the guests go first. Dr. Arendel, please. Oh, wow. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. Good evening, Monstrations and viewers abroad uh, as well. Um, thanks for this opportunity, I must say, to Narissa and the rest of the team. My name is Rhoda Arendel. Uh, yes, I'm a linguist, author, founder of Source of Inspiration and Learning, and uh, a very unique business package of coffee, books, and training, right, here in St. Martin. Uh, I'm an educator also, and a mother of two. And my passion is linguistics, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to add some value to the discussion this evening in Montserrat. I'm sure you will, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anne-Marie? Can you hear me all right? Yes, I'm hearing you well. Are okay. you hearing Dr. Arndell? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, I am a, I'm a lifelong teacher trying hard to retire, um, not succeeding very well, I guess because my passion is education. My passion is also, um, although I'm not a linguist, my passion is the Creole language um, and the culture of Montserrat, the Caribbean by extension. I've been involved in the performing arts for you know, many, many years. And um, I was telling a, a, a class today that this year made 52 years since I entered the classroom as a teacher. I am in the process of producing a book of Creole poetry, um, poems written over the last 40 years. I have been very delinquent about publishing, but I'm really, really excited to be part of the discussion tonight. And um, looking at the panel, looking at my, 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 my colleague in the panel, I think I'm going to learn quite even more that I can give. And I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually excited um, to be speaking with both of you. And Dr. Arundel, in particular about the languages that, I, I, that you that are part of your life. But before we get to that, let me first just ask you, what was it about, just to get us started, um, what was it about this particular topic, this particular um, question that 
grabbed your attention for today, for this evening? What was it that, what, what did it um, generate inside you? What thoughts came to you? How do you feel about the idea? No, oh, that's a very interesting. Any anytime I hear anything about language and Caribbean languages, I automatically get excited. Um, if you would permit me, I prepared a little five minute yes. intro to this because after reading the question over and over and over, I was trying to answer it, and I think I will try to answer it. But for me, it raises more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. So if you would permit me. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. So well, well, trying to do justice to the topic, I, I figured I would start with at least two very um, important terminology so that we, when we start a discussion, that we'll be on the same page, right, in terms of how these words are used in linguistics. Um, language, for example is described as a, a vehicle which permits us to express our thoughts mm -hmm. and feelings, right? So to communicate with others, to share knowledge. Um, so it is formed based on our ideas or concepts. And, and these ideas are, and concepts can change depending on which cultural elements are dominant at any given time. And I want to put that out there for our discussion this evening. Also the word dialect because in the Caribbean, it has so many different nuances. Mm -hmm. But in, in linguistics, we, we use it merely to refer to any particular form of a language, which is, which is specific to a certain region or group or, you know, people in an area. So for me, the beauty in dialects is that they are identity markers, right? distinguishing us from each other. So, you know, in St. Martin, we have a tendency, we say, ah, he's from Dominica, he's from Guadeloupe, he's from Trinidad. Because we think that we can tell where people are from just by the way they speak. And I and I think most Caribbean people will say that, right? And, and so we know that the history of language is the history of mankind. And as far as we can tell, there have always been varieties of languages when people live in a space, right? And because societies are generally stratified, you get a kind of hierarchy of the different varieties and the groups. I wanna put that out there as well. And so from our history here in the Caribbean, and I'm now referring to specifically the English speaking territories, we know that um, how we came about, how our varieties came about was due to contact between English slavers, colonizers, and enslaved Africans, and to some degree, the languages of the indigenous people in the region, depending on the space that it happens. Mm -hmm. And our education systems, I believe, have that we have inherited coming out of this, I can't say coming out because we're still in the colonial conversation mm -hmm. today, but the systems of education that we have inherited were designed to preserve British and other European culture and promote European interests. And I think that has to be said in the context of the conversation that we're going to have with regard to nation building. And from these systems, we have learned that, number one, um, the Queen's English, as we just say uh, in, in St. Martin, or the, 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 we say the, the um, what is it, the King's English, Neither the king or the queen would speak it, but the king's English or the queen's English or whatever version of the thing is predominant, right? So we, we know that. And it, it, it is to be standardized, right? That is the standard that all the colonial subjects would have, would have used or would have known or would have mastered or would have been told to master. And so the school system would have taught us how to love the, the king and the queen system, the queen, king and the queen's English, but it also would have told us that we were to separate ourselves from anything African or of African heritage. That would have been very important. Um, at the same time, we would have been told that if you can't speak it, there's something wrong with you, right? There's a form of bastardization. The term that is used often in linguistics basically saying that Africans who can't master these European languages, something was wrong with them, some sort of broken transmission that would have taken place to show that Africans, you know, 
can get it, right? So there are all of these different things that are on the table in this conversation. For me, when we have the conversation about nation building and, and resisting, the question that, that raised you know, my eyebrows was that what are we resisting? And, and because we known, we've, we known from the beginning that we got here that we've been resisting, right? And mm -hmm. Africans have used all forms of resistance that we could use, including language. So we know that. The question is, as a colony like St. Martin, Montserrat is having a discussion on nation building. So what is the nation that Montserrat is trying to build in the context of a colony? And when we are resisting, what exactly are we resisting? What is the, the place of the Montserrat dialect, for example, or dialects in terms of officialdom in policy and planning? Where does that fit? Because we know that Every day, every decision that we make is a choice based on our worldview, right? We all make decisions every day, including linguistic decisions on our worldview. So what is the worldview in, in, in the individual in Montserrat or the, the, the government policy makers, et cetera, when we're having this conversation about nation building? So there are a number of questions and I will leave them this, these here for now as we go into the discussion. Excellent, thank you. Ms. Jure, what came up for you when you, what is it that you want to start us off with with regard to your response to this topic? First of all, that my friend Arrow would have been very pleased with this discussion tonight. And, um, you know, his, his, his admonition to use this language more and more, be proud of your own culture. Um, because as, as it was just pointed out, language is really the, 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 the major way in which we transmit um, our ideas, our feelings about, you know, the world around us. Mm -hmm. um, our, in fact, it, transmit our own feelings and our feelings about the world around us. The thing is that I, th I think for me, one of the one of the difficulties has been the fact that the Montserrat language, and I, I prefer to use the term Creole, and I'll explain why in a minute, but that the Montserrat language, we, 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 we still have a tendency to say, you're talking bad, mm -hmm. speak properly, you know, um, why, why are you speaking so badly? And we, we tell our children that. And so we perpetuate the idea that there's a very low value attached to our language. And this is something which we have grown up with here. We, I, I suppose people have learned the, the, you know, that if you want to get ahead, you speak the Queen's English. If you want to progress in life, you speak the Queen's English. And uh, I think the time has come for us to recognize the importance um, of, of, of owning, of valuing, and of celebrating our language. And I think for me, it is not that we celebrate one over the other, but it is that we appreciate the fact that we can be bilingual, that in fact, we are bilingual. You see, when we talk about being bilingual, in most cases, we're talking about English plus French or English plus Spanish. And we're not thinking in terms of maybe English plus our Creole language, or let me put it the other way, our Creole language plus English, so that we understand that there are contexts for both. We understand that there is utility for both, but um, we understand that in the main, the people of Montserrat identify with most of them, and certainly grassroots level, identify with our Creole language. Now, I, I prefer the term Creole, and it's not that I have any major disagreement with dialect but dialect i i came across a definition which suggested that dialect was a form of broken 
um, a, a broken form of a language. And it is because that definition has been attached so strongly to what we speak, to our Creole, <coughs> that I decided um, some time ago that I would not use that word. The, the word Creole really um, is an extension of a Latin, Latin word, which means to create, to produce. And what it seems to me is that over centuries, over generations, we have creatively as a people taken words that we wanted to take from languages, taken expressions, taken, um, I don't have all the linguistic terms, but taken the, 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 the grammar, let me put it, let me, let me use a nice simple word, taken the grammar, the, the, the form, the structures, um, as we wanted to take them and as they um, suited us. I think of the English language, for example. The English language, when it wanted to find certain words to express certain things, it borrowed words from French, it borrowed words from Latin, and it created its own structures. I think of the words herbs, for example, which I learned a long time ago, which meant a city in Latin. And so in the English, we talk about urban and suburban. And so I'm thinking that over years, in, in, in building up our Montserrat Creole language, which now has a very definite structure, definite form, it is possible to speak bad Creole, just like it is possible to speak bad English. Yes. And, I, and, and bad Creole, bad, Bad English is not Creole. Creole has its own form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, in the same way, you know, if, if we lack, if, if, we, if we can't find a word to express what we want, we, we, we can create a word. You know, we can make a word. We, or we can borrow a word from another language as we, as we see fit. Now, that, that doesn't mean that it is easy. It is simple. There's nothing simple about this. But um, this is perhaps the... The, the main thing that I, I personally would want to put across that our language, the very fact that it has, it has continued to exist despite all efforts to, 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 to get rid of it, to devalue it, despite all those efforts, it has um, a resilient quality to it. It has remained, it has grown to the point and developed to the point where it is an actual language. I think that that is where the resistance um, comes in to me. Yes. If I may. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I'm loving this already, <laughs> my dear. Um, there's a little challenge in, in, in modern linguistics, and I'll say modern uh, using the understanding progressive linguistics and i will use more progressive elements of linguistics in terms of caribbean scholars mm -hmm. with the word creole to define the variety that we speak right if you if you look at the the development of the term over the years over the centuries over 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 the the field we we would see that the word creole in that context to refer to the varieties that we speak has a, a sort of pejorative term in terms of their pure languages and there are these things called creole languages right um which when you look at language development and acquisition there has not been yet in the field of linguistics any let's say evidence or at least overwhelming evidence to support that um that these are a special class of languages right yes mm -hmm. caribbean languages having gone through this process that we call creolization or whatever that process is that cultural process but in terms of as a linguistic group it it is like a myth right it, and it stems from that that notion that there were pure languages which are the european mm -hmm. languages and then there are these 
other <laughs> languages that seem to develop differently than all other languages around the world. So for me as a linguist, I would caution, you know, because I started off this journey as well, using the same terminologies, because I was taught like that in my, my undergraduate studies. And the more and more as Caribbean linguists get involved in the field, we are pushing back on that narrative that, and that's why I started with the, with the definition. Mm -hmm. Hello. Okay. I think we lost Dr. Aaron now. Um, yeah, so okay. I, okay, I, she's I, back. I, it seems like I disappeared somewhere. Yes, well, in yeah. minute, yeah. okay. St. Martin's internet. Um, <laughs> and so what I'm saying is that the classification of Creole as a group of languages seems to be problematic in modern day linguistics because then it would, it would signify that there's some kind of language development that takes place in these languages that doesn't take place in other so-called pure languages. So, and I, and, and I don't know if you heard this, but mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm, I'm using the word dialect and I agree with you that um, this word dialect in Caribbean circles certainly seems to have taken on a really weird range of nuances. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the, to the simple definition that it's a variety spoken in a particular space or belonging to a particular group of people, what we tend to do, at least myself and some of the other more progressive elements, is to use the terminology or the, the adjective or the nationality of the place where it is spoken. So in St. Martin, my language is St. Martin or the St. Martin vernacular. I don't refer to it as a Creole language. It is another dialect of the English language, just like Irish is or Gaelic or Scottish or whatever, just another dialect, right? And I've been able to come to that conclusion based on the study of these so-called features, because in linguistic you know, typology, there are all these features of Creole languages and non-Creole languages, and, and they're supposed to be like a range of features that would put Jamaican Patois at some of the spectrum and um, Trinidadian or Barbadian English at another spectrum at the other end. And there are these languages that are competing in between for this space on this spectrum. When in reality, there is no, there's not been any evidence to say, okay, these are the features that our Creole languages have, or these features must be found in a language in order for it to be called a, a, a Creole language. And so we're moving away from that sort of racist kind of narrative that these are so-called Creole languages. And so my preference is to call it Montserratian or St. Martin, just mm -hmm. like you call it Haitian mm -hmm. or Jamaican or Crucian mm -hmm. or American or, or, you know, with the term Creole more like a, a process that the languages might have gone through and the speakers might have experienced in this Caribbean space. So that's the only thing I'm, I'm guarding. So again, coming back from when I saw the question, I was like, oh, dialect, nice. But what does that mean, dialect, mm -hmm. for the people in Montserrat? Because I know in, in Jamaica, for example, it has a very negative, well, very kind of negative mm -hmm. connotation. But for me, when I use it, I know my St. Martin dialect is no different than a, than a Scottish dialect, for example. Can, can I, I just clear up? Can yes. I just clear up a, a point? And I am very happy that you made that um, that suggestion. And and the thing is that I don't think here we ever use the word Creole just like that. It's mm -hmm. always Montserratian. But the other yeah. thing is, I I remember Doctor. I think it was um, Brackwit. Um, ah, I don't remember the name of the book, might have been Roots 93 or somewhere, talking about nation language. Kamau Brathwaite. Kamau Brathwaite. And he had, a, he had an issue too with both, both terms. I, mm -hmm. I, I think he, he felt that it was far better to refer to it. Maybe better is not the word, but maybe a more appropriate in his context to refer to um, the languages that we speak, which are not standard English, our, our, our national languages, to refer to them as nation languages. I just wondered what you thought about that. Sorry, Shirley. I yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that, I'm that's quite a, happy to sit back and listen to this. That's, that's a key point because I, I hear it too. 
And I, again, in early studies, you see it and you've come across it. And I know other people who use the term too, but from a purely linguistic point of view, right? Mm -hmm. We kind of guard against the label as a classification because by definition, all languages of all people are national languages. Right, right? yes. Just by definition. Yes. So when you start to separate that for the Caribbean, you're saying in essence, there's something different about the way Caribbean people acquire language as mm-hmm. opposed to other people. And that's not the case, right? Yes. We're yeah. normal human beings like every other human mm-hmm. being in our language. Acquisition is the same <laughs> process as for other humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in, yes, uh, I'm glad you, the, you, you've you gone on this particular track because one of the questions I wanted to ask was, what is the difference in fact between language and dialect? I mean, um, Dr. Arundel, you, your bio says that you studied in Puerto Rico. You live in you live in Jamaica in Saint Martin, so I assume you know French, um, Dutch, <laughs> and you speak English, and you speak a Caribbean language. And and it seems we are talking about hierarchies of language. And I know that in in English, as in French, in Spanish, in Italian, not in Portuguese, all those other languages, there are what are called regional dialects. And so when you're talking we're having this conversation with whether it's a dialect a language whether it's creole does it really yeah. matter i mean not does it obviously it does why does it matter in terms of nation building that we call it a language as opposed to a dialect of english like in um no, i don't know up in umbria in north in north, northumberland or somewhere they're speaking or in in napoli they speak a different kind of italian it's called a dialect but it's, it's mm-hmm. recognized as italian what do you both think of that what does it mean well when you look at again ling- how linguistics use the word dialect versus another language we tend to say that all the speakers of these varieties these dialects should be able to understand each other and that would be the the border right Mm -hmm. where it crosses over into another language supposedly supposedly again because these are claims that are made and then you can think of all these examples that don't hold up right um so supposedly when they are no longer mutually intelligible we say they are now separate languages right Mm -hmm. but if you think just of the english language for example or uh, and and i'll use German and Dutch. Yes, I I, I, I speak Dutch. But there are, there are people who speak German to me, and I can understand what they're saying, and we can go. But, but we know that German and Dutch are two separate languages. And I also know within the Dutch language, for example, there are varieties of the, the Dutch language, so dialects of the Dutch language, where certain speakers of the Dutch language don't are not able to understand each other. And with English. So when you think of like I, I have family in the UK and you think of the Scottish and, and you know and the Irish and technically speaking, technically speaking, they you know they're separate languages, but to a certain extent they're considered, you know, dialects of the of the English language in some spaces. And so I go from the simple definition that the dialect is a regional variety, and oftentimes the people who's who live in the space share that dialect. In St. Martin, for example, because we're colonized by both the French and the Dutch, and our people are an English-speaking people, our English English variety has nuances depending on where you went to school. Mm -hmm. So so those two would be separate dialects of the St. Martin language, right? Mm -hmm. So if you live in a part that we refer to in the North that's called French part, and you went to school in all French, your English has a lot of French nuances, your pronunciation, your word choices, your even the structure, the grammatical structure comes out a little differently than when you are, like when you went to school in the South where I went to school, where either Dutch or English was the language of instruction and it has a different nuance. So even within the St. Martin variety, you get these different dialects. And so I'm going back to the discussion about the monstration, right? I, I'll just use the term monstration. I'm not going to add the label Creole, but the question is, it, is it a dialect of what? Is it a dialect of the English language? Because in order for it to be a dialect, it has to be a dialect of some other entity, some mm-hmm. other language. 
because that's a definition, right? Like a regional variety of a particular language. And then if you say it's a it's a variety, it's a dialect. It's a dialect of what? And for us in Saint Martin, my conclusion is that ours is a dialect of English. But like all Englishes of the world, whether it's Indian English or Australian English or Saint Martin English, it's a different variety with a different set of nuances and therefore a different dialect. So let me ask you, Anne Marie. Let me switch a little bit for you, because um, I like Montserratian language. I mean, I in English you say "I'm not going." In Montserrat you say "Me na go." It's very different. It's very different. So very it's a language on its own. There, there you go. But Anne Marie, you are an artist. You're a musician. Does it matter how and where? Does it matter the the place, the space, the time which the music, the the language is used? But Mali, for example almost always spoke in Jamaican. And I read an article a while ago, well, many years ago, obviously, um, that he did that on purpose because that was his language. And he expected the people who understood English to um, understand him or to ask him to explain. Mm -hmm. And that we are clear that Bob Marley was doing that in protest. So when I say Minago, or when I, you know, if I speak in the store in Montsrasham, Am I, am I, is that also a form of protest or does it have to be artistic and does it matter also if it's written or not? And Dr. Dr. Arundel afterwards, I'd like you to also answer that too. Does it matter if the language is written or not? But Anne-Marie? Yeah, and that, that, that last bit is extremely important. But you see, the, the, the way in which we have been brought up, let me put it that way, is that Creole language, our Montserratian language is fit for the street. It's fit for certain circumstances, but not for others. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was usually felt that people who spoke like that, uh, people who used that language, were people who were at the bottom rung of society. And we have to remember, too, that the values that are attached to a language are, are social constructs. They are the values attached by the society. And so we have been so conditioned, you know, that everything that was European was good and everything that was African or that we made or, you know, was not, was not good. We have been conditioned like that. So... Maybe it's maybe it's a form of, 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 of protest, but I just think that people should be free to use the language um, that they are most comfortable with and that other people can understand um, wherever. Mm -hmm. Now there are, let, let me give you an example. In St. Lucia, my understanding is that part of the throne speech in St. Lucia at the opening of Parliament is given in 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 um in Coyol. Um and that there are other places where in Jamaica there was a, there was an experiment some years ago about actually doing teaching, delivering instruction in, 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 in Jamaican language. I think that if people can understand that it it you know you should be you should be comfortable to speak in the language that you are most comfortable with. And I think the whole notion of what language is proper for this or for that um, is something that we really need to think about. Now, I know people will probably throw stones at me. You know, you can't, you can't get up in parliament and give a speech. You can't, you can't reply to the budget speech in, in, in dialect. I don't see why not, but then... Anyway. Premier, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, how you mean you're going to spend $1 million on uh -huh. What kind of nonsense that? I mean, you will get people who, who, who probably will fuss about that. But the, 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 the fact is, taking it seriously... Um. I think there has been a breaking down of some of that now. I don't think that um I don't think that view is pushed as much. And you know why? I could be wrong. And um please, Dr. Arundel, tear me to pieces if you think I'm wrong. But I think the more that we have people who are regarded 
as influential in society, the elites, the moneyed people, the people who, 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 who run things, the more of those who embrace the language and who maybe use it from time, even if they're using it in joke, you know, if once they're heard to be using it, um, I think that it breaks down some of those barriers and people feel a bit more comfortable. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share a brief anecdote. Um, I, so I teach or taught for a while at the university here, the, lo the local university, and um, I make it a point to use a St. Martin in my classes, right? And by the way, at the University of the Virgin Islands, in, in St. Croix at least, students can write papers in Crucian, right? Because that was a question about whether it, if it matters if it is written. And mm -hmm. so there are some professors who just permit that to happen in the classroom, and I'm one of those people. But I remember in my class, um, you know, so I do this every semester, I introduce myself, I, you know what is happening. And at the end of the class, you know, one young lady of Eng in uh, Indian descent living here, you know, she very dismissive left. And with after about two or three weeks, she came to me. She said, you know what? I need to apologize to you. And I said, why are you apologizing? What did I do? She said, well, on the first night when we, you know, you introduced yourself, etc., went home and I said to my dad, um, I'm not going back because my gosh, I speak better English than the teacher, right? Something like that. And she was apologizing because uh -huh. I think she, she, she understood after three weeks that this is always what's going to be. And I could, and she said, you know, you know what you're doing or something to that effect. But I, because of exactly what you just said there, I make it a point, right? Because I don't know how many people, I don't know how much influence, but I make it a point that people know that um, my language is part of my identity, who I am and how proud I am of my language. And so I make it a point to always use it. There are times when you have to ameliorate or bring yourself more to, to, the, to, the, to the middle, like what they would call broadcast English, or as we are doing here this evening, in order to be understood, I believe, to a broader audience. But... Um, it's not something I do often. Um, so it is what it is, but I've gotten both positive as well as negative feedback. So there are those people who still hold to those notion of, of properness. And when I tell them about themselves, then, you know, that's how, you know, we, we do it in the Caribbean. But um, that, that question about whether or not it matters that the language is written, for me, it is important. And this is why in my book, I try to, I dedicate a chapter to the grammar of the St. Martin English, right? The St. Martin language. I've, I've gone through the rules. Uh? So in linguistics, we speak of the TMA, right? The tense, the mood, the aspect. And this is how you know the rules of the language. And so I've done that for the St. Martin language. I don't think it's exhaustive, but I think it's a beginning in the conversation of, you know, those of us who have the ability and have the opportunity with the pen to write it. To write it so that the children that are coming up can see it and appreciate it. But I also do it because I know there are a lot of people who don't know or who may not know that this is. Because like everything else, two languages evolving, right? And so there are expressions that are lost with our modernization and, and properness. But there are also structures that are being lo lost. So where you just said like Minambo and in, 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 in maybe in, in Monstration or Jamaica. In St. Martin, there was a time where... In the St. Martin language, the bin, in bina, or that is heard in St. Kitts today still, or in Jamaica, uh, in me bina, which is a very African particle, has disappeared. It has mm -hmm. disappeared from our variety. We don't use it anymore, but it exists in all the forms of the language. And so for me, it is important that we write it down, if for no mm -hmm. other reason to preserve what is there so that the next generations that are coming are able to, to see it. Yeah, I totally agree with you that language is about identity. I mean, language forms, informs, is formed by, is informed by our reality. And um, nation building is the reality within which we, we, we use this language. And of course, that has to do also with identity, who you are as a nation and how um, you present yourself, as it were, to the world. 
So I, I'd like you both to talk to me about, I, I know because Montserrat, we are clear, everybody knows that Montserrat is trying to rebuild, and we know the reasons why. So we are, we, recover, we are trying to rebuild from colonialism and the history that we, that's common to us. And we have the, the added um, challenge of rebuilding from destruction, from just massive ongoing destruction. St. Martin, I know, is also having a lot of activity around identity and nation and whether it's one nation, two, and so on. So what, how, how does one go about making the language I want to say access, acceptable, so we don't talk about, you know, session while we don't talk about bad. How do we go about making it? I mean, and we said earlier about, you know, having the elites and the money people use it. It still is the reality that in schools, teachers are going to say, uh uh, that is bad. So where must it begin? Where must it begin? Does it begin with the individual having a strong sense of identity and speaking her language, or must it absolutely necessarily come from above somewhere? And and I, also, how do we manage? How do we navigate when the the formal proper language is quote unquote required? Right, oh, that's a big one. Um, it goes both ways, right? It's 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 never either or. It's mm -hmm. always plus, as as Anne Marie was saying earlier. But if you, I I take the state of Israel for example as a as a state that we know it today. We know how old it is. It's not very a, a very old state. And we know today the official language there is modern Hebrew, which didn't exist before the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. It did not exist. And so because um, old, um, what were you saying, ancient Hebrew had to be revived, right? When the state is being formed, because the, the Jewish people who are going to settle now in the state of Israel understood the importance of language to nation building, they had all their best scholars go back and revive the language, put it in, 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 in writing and in text so that all new generations coming forward are going to learn this language. Today it's the official and the only official language of the state of Israel. So that was true policy and planning, right? And this is why that language policies are important to nation building. So while we're promoting it in the arts, because our artists are the vanguards of our language, and so certainly it will live there, but as like you've mentioned earlier, oftentimes it is used either in mockery or mm -hmm. you know in carnival because it's our it's this we culture tonight is we culture, but tomorrow we go back to school it's like we culture mm -hmm. not in school, right? Um, and so we 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 have these limited spaces for it, and it can only behave in this space. If you put it in language policy and planning on the official level that says it has a place here. And these are the ways we go about embracing it, using it, um, promoting it, studying it, as we did, you, you mentioned rightfully in, in St. Lucia with the Creole, um, in other parts of the world, that is how it is done. That is how it is done. So if it's going to live on beyond just, you know, a people's language or a language of folklore and that's it, then that's where it will live, right? Languages are not like, like, artifacts in a museum that you can put them in a in a glass case and watch them as you pass by and say that's our heritage for them to live people have to speak them mm -hmm. people have to use them and we have to use them meaningfully in spaces that matter if we're going to make a difference thank you Anne marie i'm not hearing you you you're mute me. Oh, yeah, there you go. Right. Yes. <laughs> now, I didn't hear the very last part of the question, but certainly for the for the beginning of it, mm -hmm. we have to be intentional about um, preserving and protecting our language because it is our identity. It 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 um our proverbs, our expressions, our um, our stories, our you know, our our deepest thoughts, um, the, the 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 particular words we use that have specific meanings, and those meanings are shared by people who share our language. So it's got to be something in policy. It's got to be 
it's got to be thought up it's got to be planned it, it can't just be hopefully that a few people will will you know hear this discussion tonight and take it up it's got to be intentional the other thing is that we can't wait until we are on the brink of independence to decide that we are that that yeah, that like national it. pride is to be built we have to start it now um every school child every 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 kindergarten child has got to start knowing about Montserrat and about what makes us who we are and about our language. Now, here is the thing. We don't have to pivot completely to our Montserratian language. And you notice I'm using the word our Montserratian language. Thank you. Yes. We don't have to pivot all the way to that and, 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 and go the reverse that english is english is not for us anymore because english is the language in which we're going to make money english is the language of our commerce um and we should be learning spanish and and, and, and french in the same thing too especially spanish but having said that <clears throat> having said that everyone everyone so from the children up when you hear a child speaking creole speaking our dialect whatever we call it when we hear a child with it, a concerned person, yeah, and, and there are a lot of those. But what about asking the child, can you translate that for me or can you say that in English? And having the child there say what they're saying in English and complimenting the child, you see that? You can speak two languages. We don't have to do it all the time to make the child feel that every time they speak in our language mm -hmm. that we're going to pivot back to, 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 to English, you know. It's not something to, to, to be whipped about. But, uh, but the important thing is that we, we communicate and intentionally communicate the fact that we're living in a world where there are several important languages. There's Spanish language in the Caribbean is, is, is really key. Mm -hmm. There's English. And there's our national language. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with serving them up on the same plate. And it's not a question necessarily of appropriateness for all of that, 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 that anyone is more appropriate than the other. But it depends on the context. Mm -hmm. You know, so children need to understand if you're writing a letter to somebody um in to, to try and get funding for something and that person is an english speaker you're going to write in english uh, you know and 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 the other problem too is that we don't have a formal written lexicon for our mm -hmm. language so that people spell words differently and sometimes it can be a nightmare trying to work out what is the exact um uh, what's the exact spelling you know, you get two or three different um, people writing exactly the same sentence mm -hmm. and they will spell words. They may not, they, they, the form, the, the structure may be the same, but the words spelled differently. Yeah. How do we overcome that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I like the idea of, of speaking different languages. I think it's not just I like the idea, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. You know, um, growing up in the Caribbean, many of us got sent off to Europe to school. And I remember being on the bus in London, in England, all over England, with my sisters, my friends, and we would speak Montserratian on purpose because we were speaking a different language so the other people couldn't understand. It gave us a whole bunch of protest. pride. <laughs> yes, protest. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so let me ask you, I, I want to switch this up a little bit though, because um, there, are three women, there are three women speaking here. And there's Narissa in the background. So there are four women speaking about language. And I think it's just really interesting for a number of reasons. We're talking about protests, so we are actually also talking about politics. And women, as we know, have always been the foot soldiers, the people underneath who make so much happen in politics. Uh, a couple of years ago, I also read, um, I found this article about the language gene, FOXP2, that is according to the scientists and it's on um, folks from MIT in the US and a German university and somewhere else. Um, and they determined that this, this gene 
is more prevalent or, or is stronger in the more vocal sex of species. So in birds, in many birds where the male is the colorful, noisy one, the FOXP2 gene is stronger in them. In humans, it's stronger in women. So the question I have, since women, and, and I think there's, a, there's been some conversation about whether, how language began and whether it began with women and all that. How do we fit women? Where do women come in, in this um, generating this acceptance um, and elevation, if you will, of our language to a place of, through protest, through protest to a place of, um, what's the word, Ms. Dior, what's the word? A place of eminence. How do we do that? How do women, what part do women have to play in that? Is it specific or just, you know? Very specific, I think. <laughs> ah, very oh, specific. Listen, <laughs> you guys are you guys are giving me a lot tonight. Um, why I say this? I just had some discussions with some German linguists a few a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. They they they're writing a project. They want to do research on Saint Martin and da 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 da, and they asked me to get involved. And one had come before, and we had some discussions, and I. Basically, my position is this. A lot of what you're saying sounds cute for a project to research, but it has no bearing on the ground where I live, right? Uh, and, 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 I, and, I, and I basically said it's a lot of racist nonsense, and I use the word BS, right? Um, and we had a long discussion. So I have no problems, you know, with research and, and, you know, these genes and things, but I'm very guarded against this conversation or this narrative of women versus men. I, mm -hmm. Every time I hear these women things, I get a little uneasy because I said, there we go again, you know, our women against our men, you know, that, those kinds of conversations. So it may be something there. It may or may not be. But then for me, you would have to explain, you know, all these other great men who are great linguists who are so multilingual. And you, it's the same thing with the whole language tree, right? in the European language tree, and this is where our languages came from, etc. And I was like, but it does not account for one single African language or one indigenous language. That, so I keep reminding my students that Europe and the United States are not the center of the universe, you know? Just <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. That's mm -hmm. what I would say. Take it with a grain of salt because there are all these other cultural nuances that go into these conversations that, you know, being the Afrocentric woman that I am, it's from sometimes very hard to buy into it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they would have to convince me over time. <laughs> okay. I um I think too that the role that women have played in the whole um the whole what's the word I want? Um valuing, um building up passing on of the language i think sometimes is not um recognized it's not it's not pushed enough you know it's it's like mm -hmm. women even in the whole conversation about the the resistance that um Ooh. and Marie's frozen yeah yeah okay let's hope she comes back oh she's Oh, she's gone. Okay. See, it's a Caribbean thing. Just yeah. Okay. Am I, am I back? back? back. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're back. Yes. It's a Caribbean thing. Yeah. Oh, I yes. think that the, the, the role that women have played in 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 the whole protest, the whole it, it's more than protest. It's the it's the resilience, the 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 mm. building up, and of bringing our languages to where they are today, of imparting them to the children. Um, and of imparting aspects of the culture, of 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 keeping the 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 you know the sort of mixes of of keeping that going, I think has been maybe under recognized. Let me put it that way. Not to say that men have not been um, critical, but I would also say that women also have a role to play in the whole idea of um, you're talking bad, mm -hmm. talk properly. So they also have a role to play in correcting that because I think that there are quite a few women 
who have that idea. Mark you, um, some of the greatest critics of my, some of the critics of my, um, my, my poetry have been males who have told me that, you know, you're too educated to talk like and that. write in dialect. Yeah. I got accosted wow. after a performance a few years ago. Mm -hmm, I thought mm -hmm. I, you know, the audience had clapped and they had laughed and they had been serious when I was serious. And then this man came up at the end of it saying, you know, I've always respected you so much, but you're, you're an educated woman and you should not be. Why are you writing and speaking, yeah. you know, wow. in, 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 in this language, you know? So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's, that's, that happens so much. I remember I have a story. My mother once, I came home from school one day and my mother said somebody had complained. We have to, we have to be intentional yet. Somebody had complained. It turns out it actually was a man too, had called her and complained that they heard Shirley speaking on the street and, talk, on the street and talking bad. And she's not supposed to do that because my mother's a teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And my mother, to her credit, said, um, I just hope she was speaking it well. Because you need to speak it properly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. And so that is what that is the energy. I think that's the that's the approach we should take to Lang. So when you spoke, um, uh, Anne Marie earlier about asking children to translate into English, mm -hmm. I think perhaps we also should very much do it the other way around. Also yes. to, to to you know to give them that sense that they must also learn this language because they are being we, our children are being taught to not speak bad not speak mm -hmm. bad mm -hmm. um the other question has to do with regional dialects and we are running we're running um close to we have some some few minutes left but we have all our caribbean languages and our caribbean languages are getting mixed in montserrat we talk a lot about being overtaken by jamaican language and there is a sense that jamaican language jamaicans use their language very much as a, as, as protest um, Monta is not the only person with, not the only country I hear that from. I was in Vizia last week and I heard the same thing. So I, the question here is the idea of a Caribbean language that has these dialects uh, in the English speaking Caribbean, can we, can we conceive of a Caribbean language that has a Montserratian dialect, a Jamaican dialect, a Trinidadian dialect. Does that make sense? And what, what could that possibly do for nation building at a regional level? Generally speaking, <laughs> in linguistic evolution, it goes uh -huh. the opposite way. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> it happens to break away. So language comes yeah. up, right? Once, mm -hmm. when, once two people meet, there will be shared experience and yeah. things will transfer one to the other, right? So generally speaking, usually it's a two-way street, right? Mm -hmm. And the, again, the proportion of which who is in the space and who is dominant will say a lot, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's how it works. Um, and this is the reason why you have all these varieties in the Caribbean already. It's the same more or less mixing of African, Europeans and indigenous people to a certain extent. However, in each linguistic space, it is different proportions of Africans to Europeans. It's a different, maybe a different, even a different century mm -hmm. or different economic activity, whether it's on the sugarcane plantation or it's in the salt pan in St. Martin or it's so all of these things are factors. So with the migration of our people moving from one direction to the next, because in St. Martin, for example, I'm sure in, in Montserrat is the same thing. Um, with music, you see it a lot faster in music and, and, and dress. When our, our parents went, let's say, to Panama or went off to other spaces like the Dominican Republic, for example, and, and, and in the Dominican Republic is an interesting thing taking place there where a lot of people of St. Martin descendants that have settled in a little enclave in the Dominican Republic have created a form of the St. Martin English, which we call a crystallized variety that our people today don't speak, but they'll speak it still over there because it's, mm -hmm. it's been crystallized, right? And mm -hmm. that happens, that happens. So as the beauty in, in migration is that as we, we move among ourselves, 
and and Anne Marie mentioned the borrowing. I think it was you actually just now earlier, moderator, that you know how English borrowed from French, but French also borrowed from English. Yeah, Today, mm -hmm. le computer is a word, you word. Mm -hmm. words, words to you know l'ordinateur, which is the French equivalent. Nobody says l'ordinateur. We say le computer because yeah. the French is now borrowing from English, right? So it it is a reality of language contact. I don't know how we could come to a one. I, I, I gave the example of, oh, China has a very interesting development taking place where previously, years before, China would have said, you know, multiple dialects, we, 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 we embrace that. There are so many and we accept and each dialect could have its own written form, etc. With over a few hundred languages, from what we're told, or dialects of the Chinese, China is trying now to centralize and bring it back mm -hmm. to the center. So that that also happens, right? Policy and planning. And so I would see it happening in a China where it's one sovereign space, right? Sovereign entity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I dare you touch Caribbean people language and tell them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they all need to speak. Yeah. That would be protest. <laughs> yeah. so, so that... So that and we a language um, teacher that is um language changes as circumstances change as people move around and so on but the resisting language resisting the dominance of jamaican for example is a form of protest it's another way of holding on to this other part of us can that does that not damage is the word. Does that help us um, strengthen our identity, um, separating us from ourselves, to my mind, in a sense? Um, and how does it compare with resisting the other forms? So we resist the Jamaican because if we don't resist ourselves, we're resisting the language, but resisting the, the European um, dominance. How how do those how do we navigate that? Well, I think there, in there. I, I think I think there's a little difference mm -hmm. because on one hand you are resisting um, you're resisting total domination you're mm -hmm. resisting domination you're resisting mental psychological domination you're resisting um, a system in which you are second class you are you know a non-entity and so everything about you is is undervalued. On the other hand, when we're talking about our Jamaican brothers and sisters, and you notice I use brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. um, because we basically have all come off the same boat mm -hmm. and uh, we share a common history. And the thing is, you know, there are a lot of similarities between our Montserrat language and the Jamaican language. Um, there are a few differences, more than a few, um, but I find that uh, people, especially those who listen to dance hall and listen to, mm -hmm. to Jamaican artists um, and who spend a lot of time um, with their Jamaican friends, they tend to adopt some of the words and use some of the words. But there's still some Jamaican phrases that I have never heard Montserratians using, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, I have never heard a Jamaican say, um, uh, I can't, it, it, it's gone from my mind now, but you know, they use, it tell me say, uh -huh. it tell me say, I have never heard that being used. So there are certain, um, there, there are certain words that they will use, you know, um, and certain phrases that they will use, but, um, and I don't think it's the same thing. The, the other thing too eh, is that because in the Montserrat setting, um, we are at home. And so you, you're, hearing, you're hearing this around you all the time, the, the, the Montserratian speaking. The, the times when you may mix or listen to other music or so on, you may borrow the odd word, but I don't think it really has a major problem mm -hmm. it is a major problem you know and especially because the two languages tend to be so 
similar, although the accents, um, you know, the accents are, are a bit different. Yes, yeah, so we have, I want to ask a couple of questions more before we, before we close. One is about migration, because we talked about the Africanness of us and how we got here and what that has meant to our identity and our language and so on. Um, again, I remember being in school in England, living in England, and um, all of my friends, Jamaican and otherwise, used to start Jamaican, I would say, im. Okay, everybody does that. And if you listen to, to um, Africans in the diaspora speaking in English, whether they come from Africa or they come from the Caribbean, all of them have adopted some Jamaican. Why is that? Why is Jamaican? Why, <laughs> why has Jamaican this, Jama the Jamaican language this power? Music. Music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Export of culture, right? Um, it's, it's, it's the same conversation I have with my students, you know, the young guys, the hip hop, the, you know, how that goes. And, and they always, you know, look at the Americans, they don't know this and they don't know this. I said, but you know everything American? Mm -hmm. Exporting of your culture. Mm -hmm. um, and who's going, like Arrow, we, we're here doing this in honor of Arrow, but um, we know Montserrat as Arrow and Arrow as Montserrat, that's it, right? But where are the other Montserratian that are exporting the culture at the same level that Jamaican artists are doing that mm -hmm. to expose the rest of the world to Jamaican culture, mm -hmm. right? And especially language, music, music being the easiest. I even hear it in the <coughs> Afrobeat songs by artists from the African <coughs> continent that are borrowing the Jamaican, yes. you mm -hmm. know, language in their music. And, and again, Africans, I mean, artists share, we share, we pass things around, mm -hmm. but the, the dominance of the Jamaican dance hall, the reggae outside of Jamaica is something that, you know, huge. we can't deny. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's huge and that plays a role. And so we're going to have to look for those types of, um, how do we say, ambassadors for our language mm -hmm. that are going to, if we want to have that kind of influence. Yeah, particularly because it's not going away. Yeah, um, right. it, it is popular. And I just right. wanted to say that when I spoke earlier of um, the fact that I'm, you know, I, I do hear us borrowing a few phrases and so on. It's not that we are speaking Jamaican. <clears throat> right. It mm -hmm. is that we are we are speaking Montserratian, but we are borrowing you know, um, you know, people occasionally borrow words. And I said, especially, you know, like from hearing the music and so on, the dance hall, etc., mm -hmm. or hearing their Jamaican friends speak, they may borrow a phrase or borrow a word or two. Some of them I don't want to repeat, you know, <laughs> but uh, very colorful and very, very useful yes. words. Those are, I can tell you. <laughs> So let me just ask you another question. This, this, perhaps this one last one, and then I'll ask you to I'll ask you both to wrap up. So there is language, there's dialect, and there also is accent. Mm -hmm. So when we hear our media people on the radios have never lived in the United States, talk like Americans, what does that do to our protest? Oh. <laughs> well, you see, we, we talk about the, the, the I, I, I try to remind my students, right, like when you hear the Queen's English and the King's English, that the king nor the queen ever spoke that variety, right, mm -hmm. that, that accent. That's the reality. But it is considered what many would call broadcast English, right? Mm -hmm. Linguistic, that's the term that is used, right? Yeah. Broadcast English. And the same thing I say to one of, one of uh, an Indian friend of mine. I was like, you know, you don't, you don't sound like a she was born here. And she was like, but I can't speak St. Martin. I was like, no, you've never been to America, but you speak that same thing. <laughs> you you yeah. can speak. And so I, I joke about it, but again, it's power and prestige. Exactly. It's power and prestige. Power and prestige. Exactly. So it's down to power and prestige. And who has the power? Oftentimes, the ones that set the standard are usually a minority group. They're usually not the majority speakers, but they mm -hmm. have the power. And, they, mm -hmm. and so because they have the power, they have the prestige and we want to sound like them, you know, and that, and again, it's cool, you know, uh -huh. yeah. American. I don't know if you guys in, 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 in Montserrat have this expression, but here in St. Martin, we call them freshwater Yankees. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies, I have thoroughly enjoyed my... <laughs> <laughs> my evening i have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation <laughs> i wish we had i wish you could talk forever 
but we uh, we have to wrap up um so let me let me first of all thank you both very 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 much for your your contribution and um i want to ask you both to um give you a minute or so just to close up you know tell us sort of where we go from here you know we talked about identity we talked about hierarchies we talked about levels of you know we talked about africanness and we talked about our european um um aspects how what next what next that kind i'll start with you what next okay <laughs> So for, for me, first of all, let me thank you again, Madam Moderator, and your, your team in, in, in Montserrat. This for me was an honor indeed and a, and, a, and a privilege I don't take for granted to be able to, you know, we say to ground with the sisters. We don't get to mm -hmm. do this often. Often, I know. Right? So I truly appreciate this. Thank you, Marissa, for the invitation. Um, I would tend, because I do believe that language can serve as a unifier. It is a unifier. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be used as a tool for nation building. But for me, the question is, what is the nation? Because once you determine what the nation is, mm -hmm. then you figure out the place of this language in nation building. If it's still in the context of the colony and it, you know, the, the, the local vernacular, or the Montserrat identity marker, the Montserrat in English, doesn't fit anywhere in the space, then we have a problem. But if we're saying we are building, like 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 Miss Anne Marie said, we shouldn't wait until independence, but we're building a stronger. I would say we start putting in place certain policies, you know. And I I like the idea of the translation backwards, right? So now that you know it in standard English, can you say it? I like that idea. I think that's an exercise that any average teacher can do in the classroom, as an individual that we can start with ourselves. Mm -hmm. and getting our students to do stuff like that. But it must come again from policy makers, right? Uh, what, what do we want our language to do for us? And where do we put it in, you know, in the scope of things? So, yeah, policy and planning, a very important field in linguistics. Policy and planning. Thank you. Ms. Henry. It to be yeah. unmuted. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I would, I would, I would just, uh, you know, confirm the point that we actually need to, to start doing something. We we've we've had some discussions about this, and we need to be, we need to be determined as to the place which language, our language, um, holds in our national discourse, in our sense of self sense of worth etc because once we once we understand once we understand the power of our language then we can go on to understand other related things um, national identity is critical we have more monstrations outside of Montserrat than we do have inside mm -hmm. of Montserrat. And so it's critical that we understand <clears throat> and we, we have a shared vision and a shared understanding of the importance um, of our national Montserrat language. Very, very important that we, we have that we have that understanding. It needs to go to policy. It needs to um you know it, it needs to be planned properly we need to we need to have some direction you know and some understanding of 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 how we actually take this on yes i i agree and i thank you both very much for that the, the um i think the next question if we had time would be so where does it begin do we have to call <laughs> people out specifically individually um or do we just kind of leave it to to figure itself out because what we are protesting is our identity, our value, our worth, our right to exist as people, as, as discrete um, nations, and um, and how much this, how much our language, how important our language is, and whether our languages will be respected as such and not be um, be given derogatory or questionable um, descriptives. Mm -hmm. Nation building is a is a matter of great importance, urgency for our Caribbean, our Caribbean territories, all of us. Mm -hmm. And so, having the opportunity to have these conversations is 
important, it's valuable, it's a good thing. And I'm, I'm proud that Monsat has, is, is having this. I'm proud that Monsat is having this. And um, because we have St. Martin here, we are, you know, we, we just, we're not just speaking of English because our, our Caribbean brothers and sisters are English, Spanish, French, Dutch, yeah? Mm -hmm. and Papiamento. The, Papiamento, there you go. Yes, mm -hmm. we have all of those. And our brothers and sisters are also the Africans who speak what's called pidgin. We didn't get a chance to discuss that, but perhaps you know some other some other time when we will see this. So thank you all very, thank you both very 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 much. Thank you everybody who was listening, who made comments, who um, has taken something from this. We are expecting you. We are requesting that you go do that. Go have children translate backwards, speak our languages. Um, use them, value them, show them to be valued. And literary festivals around the Caribbean um, are a good place to begin. So thank you, Narissa. Thank you very much to the Aliwagana Ali Festival of the World for this. And thank you, Arrow, wherever you are. Thank you very, very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.